This is Dr. Elliot Hollifield, and this is video lecture for MAT 1070, covering Chapter 1, Section 5. Here we will continue the discussion about linear equations. In particular, we will discuss solving linear equations. Let's first consider a fairly straightforward example and recall that if we see an expression as such, then we can solve this for one variable in terms of the other. We can solve for the expression of y in terms of x and consider equations of this form as functions which give us a line when we are to draw the graph. So how do we rewrite this equation? Let's take the expression that we're given and add x to both sides of this equation. Then, on the left-hand side, we're left with 2y, and on the right-hand side, we get x plus 8. Now, let's divide both sides of this equation by 2. Then on the left hand side the 2's cancel and the right hand side we can simplify as 1 half x plus 8 over 2 or 4. So now we've written this expression in the standard slope intercept form where m is the slope and the b is the y-intercept. With these two pieces of information, it's very easy to draw the entire graph. In particular, if we are to plug in 0 for x, then the output is 4 which is the ordered pair 0 comma 4. Now we can get another ordered pair if we go over by one unit then the slope tells us to go up by one half unit so this ordered pair would be 1 comma 4.5. Now that we have two points which fall on the line we can draw the entire graph, which is the straight line connecting those two points. And in particular, we have these two ordered pairs which solve this linear equation. Let's practice again, starting with this equation and determining what is the x-intercept and the y-intercept in this case. The y-intercept is the ordered pair that we get when we plug in 0 for x. If we replace x by 0, then it must be that 4y is equal to minus 10, so y has to be equal to minus 10 over 4. That simplifies to minus 5 over 2. So if we take this expression and plug in 0, then the output is minus 5 over 2, which is the y-intercept. Now, an x-intercept is when the output, the y, is equal to 0. In this case, we'll set y equals to 0. 
whereas before we set x equals to 0. Now we get 7x plus 4 times 0, or 0, equals minus 10. So it must be that 7x is equal to minus 10, or x is equal to minus 10 divided by 7. Here again, we have two points which determine this graph. If the x is equal to minus 10 over 7, then the y is equal to 0. And if x is equal to 0, then the y is equal to minus 5 over 2. So without solving this explicitly for the slope, only by plotting these two points, we can determine at least that this is a line with negative slope and these are the x and the y intercepts. Here's a list of the properties we will need in order to solve a linear equation. Perhaps the most important one is the distributive property, which tells us how to multiply a number across an addition. We can think of this as distributing this multiplication to both the b and the c. So a times b plus c is equal to ab plus ac. Similarly, the multiplication could have occurred on the other side and we would get the same thing. The next properties we will use to solve equations are the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division properties. If two numbers are equal and we do the same operation on both sides of the equation, then the output, the new equation, will also be equal. Here let's practice using these properties in order to solve an equation. Here let's write the recipe. What steps are we taking to solve this equation? The first step, what has occurred? We've used the, used the distributive property to distribute this 9 across the parentheses, across the sum. Next, what step have we taken? Use the subtraction property to subtract 63 from both sides of the equation. The next step, all that's done has, has been done is to simplify, to actually do the subtraction. Next, we divide by 9 on both sides of the equation. Finally, the last step is to simplify and to realize that we're done. Now we have the variable we were after on one side of the equation by itself, and hence it must be equal to this number. Let's try another example here, and again let's write the recipe remind ourselves of the steps that we take in order to solve the equation. The first step that I see to take is to distribute this 7 across the parentheses. So after that step we should have 25 is equal to 5x plus 7x plus 49. Keep in mind, we can do our recipe in multiple different ways. Now let's first simplify. Then we will subtract 49. So after we simplify, we combine the like terms. We get 25 is equal to 12x plus 
plus 49. Now if we subtract 49 from both sides, then by design we get a cancellation on the right hand side, and on the left hand side we get 24 is equal to 12x. Lastly, let's divide by 12 to get x is equal to 24 divided by 12. Let's simplify our answer. We get x is equal to 2. Let's try another example. Again, writing our recipe. The first step I see to take again is to distribute the 2. So we get 8w minus 26 is equal to 2w minus 14. Next, let's add 26. get 8w is equal to 2w minus 14 plus 26 or plus 26 minus 14. So 8w is equal to 2w plus 12. Now let's subtract 2w to get 8w minus 2w equals 12 or 6w is equal to 12. Now, lastly, let's divide by 6 to get w is equal to 12 over 6 or w is equal to 2. Now, let's try an example without writing the recipe, but just following the steps as before, very carefully. First, we distribute this minus 4 and this 6. We need to be very careful and make sure that we distribute this minus sign along with the 4. We also need to remember that a minus times a positive gives us a minus, and a minus times a minus gives us a positive. So here we should get minus 8v plus 32 plus 8v is equal to 6v plus 36. Now let's do the simplification. I see a minus 8v and a positive 8v. Now let's rewrite our simplified equation neatly. Now let's subtract 36. 32 minus 36 must then be equal to 6v. So minus 4 has to be equal to 6v, or v dividing by 6 has to be equal to minus 4 over 6. That fraction reduces to minus 2 over 3. Let's try a similar example. Here again, we need to distribute first, being very careful with this minus sign. Minus 2 times minus 9 gives us a positive 18. A plus with a minus will give us a minus 18. Minus 4y is equal to 2y minus 8y minus 6. Now let's combine the like terms. I see a y term and a y term, a y term and a y term. 18 minus 4 gives us 14y minus 18 should be equal to 2 minus 8 gives us a minus 6y minus 6. 
Now let's add 6y to both sides. 14y plus 6y should be equal to minus 6y plus 6y minus 6. Now on the left hand side we have 20y equal to 20y minus 18 is equal to minus 6. Now let's add 18 to both sides. 20y must be equal to 18 minus 6 or 20y is equal to 12 so y dividing by 20 has to be equal to 12 over 20 now simplifying let's notice we can write 12 is 3 times 4 and 20 is 4 times 5 So this fraction simplifies to give us 3 divided by 5. Now let's try an example in which we have to solve with these fractions. I don't like fractions, so let's get rid of them. Let's think what would be the common denominator between these two fractions if we were try to, to try to add or subtract them, 6 and 10, a common denominator we could use is 60. So for our recipe, let's first multiply by 60. On both sides of the equation. On the left hand side we need to make sure that we distribute the 60 to both of these terms. And now let's simplify. If we distribute here, we'll have 60 times 5x over 6. 60 over 6 will give us 10. Minus 2 times 60, or 120, should be equal to 60 divided by 10 gives us 6. So now our simplified equation with no fractions should give us 10 times 5 should be equal to 42x. So 50x minus 120 is equal to 42x. Now let's subtract 42x from both sides. So 50x minus 42x minus 120 is equal to 42x minus 42x will give us 0. And now let's both simplify and add 120. 50 minus 42 gives us 8. So 8x should be equal to 120 or x is equal to 120 divided by 8. Now let's see how can we simplify this without using a calculator. I know that this is 12 times 10 over 8 and 12 we could write as 3 times 4 10 we can write as 2 times 5 and 8 we can write as 2 times 4. So now what cancels? 2 with 2, 4 with 4. So x must be equal to 3 times 5 or 15. Let's try another example following a similar recipe what would be a common denominator between 3 and 4 
let's take our equation and multiply both sides by 12. 12 times u over 4 should be equal to 12 times u over 3 minus 3 in parentheses. Now let's do the simplification and distribute. 12 over 4 gives us 3u. That should be equal to 12u over 3 minus 3 times 12, or 36. So 3u should be equal to 4u minus 36. Now, Let's subtract 3u, and then let's add 36. After step 2, we should have 0 is equal to 4 minus 3u. 4u minus 3u just gives us u minus 36. If u minus 36 is equal to 0, then by adding 36 to both sides, u must be equal to 36. Let's try another example. Think of what is a common denominator. If the denominators here are 2 and 3, what is the least common multiple between 2 and 3? Let's start our recipe for solving this equation by multiplying by 6. Then, on the left hand side, 6 over 2 gives us 3. On the right hand side, distributing, 6 over 3 gives us 2 plus 24. Now, let's subtract 2u. 3u minus 2u gives us u, and that should be equal to 24. Let's consider this example and let's determine whether or not there is a solution. Is there an x that we can plug into this equation and the left hand side is equal to the right hand side? Is this equation always true or is there no possible number which makes this equality true? What we need to do is to try to solve the equation. If we find an answer, then that answer will be the solution. If we distribute first, on the left and the right, we should have 3x plus 6 plus x is equal to 4x minus 4 plus 9. Now let's simplify anything that we can. 3x with x gives us 4x plus 6 should be equal to 4x 9 plus minus 4 gives us 9 minus 4, or positive 5. Now, I see a 4x and a 4x. If we subtract 4x from both sides of the equation, then what are we left with? 6 must be equal to 5, which most certainly is not true. So, if we get to this kind of logical error, then the equation that we started with must have no solution. Let's try another example and determine whether or not this equation has no solution, a solution, or it's always true for any number. If we distribute, we'll get minus 6v minus 6 plus 8v is equal to 2v minus 6 now let's add 6 to both sides so that these 6's cancel. 
Now, let's simplify. 8v minus 6v gives us 2v. On the right-hand side, we get 2v. Now, what if we take this equation and divide by v? Then we get 2 is equal to 2, which is always true. We could have looked here for any number. It doesn't matter what the number is. For any number v, 2v will always be equal to 2v. So it didn't matter what number we plugged in. So here we'll say that this equation has all real numbers as a solution. Next, let's try solving an equation of this form as a proportion with these fractions. And let's come up with the rule for why we can apply the cross multiplication. If we apply this rule of cross multiplication, then that says that 3u minus 2 must be equal to 9 times 2. But why, why is this true? Let's write our recipe again with the steps that we'll take. Well, first, to be multiply by 9 and then to multiply by 3. After step 1, we should have 9 times u minus 2 over 9 is equal to 9 times 2 over 3. So on the left hand side the 9's cancel and we're left with u minus 2 is equal to 9 times 2 over 3. Now let's follow step 2 and multiply by 3. So 3u minus 2 is equal to 3 times 9 times 2 over 3. Now the 3's cancel on the right hand side and we've arrived at the exact same place as when we just did the cross multiplication. But if we, we can also follow this recipe to get to the same exact place. Now let's take our equation, our simplified version without the fractions, and let's solve for you. We have 3 times u minus 2 is equal to 9 times 2 or 18. So 3u minus 6 should be equal to 18. 3u should then be equal to 24. So u should be equal to 24 over 3 or 8. Let's try another example here. By doing the cross multiplication, after that step we'll have 5 times y plus 5 should be equal to 4 times 9. So now we get 5y plus 25 is equal to 49. Now which step should we take? Let's subtract 25 49 minus 25, that should give us 5y is equal to 24, or y is equal to 24 over 5. And does this fraction reduce? Factors of 24, 1, 2, 3, 8, 12, 24, but 5 is a prime number, so this fraction does not reduce and we're done. Let's try another example. Let's follow our rule for the cross multiplication. That step gives us 8 times y minus 5 is equal to 6 times 3 or 8y 
minus 8 times 5 should be equal to 18. Now let's add 40. 8y should be equal to 58. So y is equal to 58 divided by 8. Now let's reduce our fraction. 58 is 2 times 29. 8 is 2 times 4. So y, canceling the 2's, is equal to 29 divided by 4. Now, let's try some word problems. Good idea for each word problem. Make sure you read it entirely. And as we read it, let's try to pull off the important information. So a total of 821 tickets were sold for a school play. They were either adult tickets or student tickets. There were 71 more student tickets sold than adult. So how many adult tickets were sold? Let's define what we're looking for to be the variable x. x is equal to the number of adult tickets. So, using the information that we have, how many student tickets were there? If there were 71 more student tickets and there were x adult tickets, then there must, must be x plus 71 student tickets. Now, what information have we not used yet? We know that there was a total of 821 tickets sold. So, in words, the number of adult tickets plus the number of student tickets must be equal to 821. So, x plus x plus 71 has to equal 821 or 2x plus 71 equals 821. Now let's subtract 71. 2x is equal to 821 minus 71. So the ones will cancel take away 20 and then take away 50 it's my way of keeping myself straight without using a calculator I can subtract by 20 I can subtract by 1 and then subtract by 50 that gives us 750. Now let's divide by 2. Which should give us 375 tickets. Now what was x? x was the number of adult tickets, which is 375. So let's go back and let's determine how many student tickets were there. There should be x plus 71. Let's cheat. Let's make sure the math is correct here. 750 divided by 2 indeed gives us 375 plus 71 gives us 446 which if we add to that plus 375 gives us the correct number of total tickets.
Let's try another example. First step, read the entire problem, and let's try to pull off the important pieces of information. A local hamburger shop sold a combined total of 628 hamburgers and cheeseburgers. There were 72 fewer cheeseburgers sold than hamburgers. So how many hamburgers were sold? Let's define the piece of information that we want as the variable x so how can we determine based on this variable x how many cheeseburgers there were if there were x hamburgers then we should have x minus 72 cheeseburgers now what's the equation that we can write the number of hamburgers plus the number of cheeseburgers needs to equal 628. So 2x, let's add 75 to both sides, should be equal to 628 plus 75. Let's cheat here. 628 plus 75, 703. Oops, I see the mistake. I'm supposed to have two here. That makes it a little easier. Let's try that again. 628 plus 72 gives us 700. So now if we divide by two, that gives us x is equal to 350. So now, that's the number of hamburgers. How many cheeseburgers do we get? Let's take 350 and subtract 72. That gives us 200. 78, which indeed adds up to 628. These problems are making me hungry. Let's again read the problem. Local hamburger shop this time sells a combined total of 476 hamburgers and cheeseburgers. The number of cheeseburgers sold was three times the number of hamburgers. So how many hamburgers were sold? Let's let x, again, be the number of hamburgers. And let's translate this sentence. The number of cheeseburgers sold was three times. That will correspond to a multiplication of x by three. If we have x hamburgers, then we'll have 3x cheeseburgers. So now there was a total of 476. So x plus 3x has to equal 476 or 4x is equal to 476. Now dividing by 4, 476 divided by 4 That gives us 119. Recall x was the number of hamburgers. So how many cheeseburgers were there? Multiplying by 3. Gives us 357. Now let's switch gears and recall some formulas that we've perhaps seen before. Here, talk about the perimeter of some kind of polygon. By perimeter, what we mean is the sum of the links 
as if we were walking around this fenced in area, add up all of these side lengths, which would total, tell us the total distance it would take to walk all the way around this fenced in enclosed area. Now, what we know is that the perimeter is given and it's 68 units. Let's try to determine the length of the side BC, which is the distance from the point, the corner B, to the corner C. In order to determine this distance, we need to know what is the value of Z. So the perimeter P is the sum of all of the side lengths. Let's start with this side length as if we were walking around this fenced in area. How far would we walk? 3z plus 11 plus z plus 2 plus 2z plus 3 plus 10. That has to be equal to 68. Now let's combine all of the like terms. We have 3z plus z plus 2z. Let's keep ourselves straight. Underline every term that's been taken care of. That should be equal to when we add 11 plus 2 plus 3 plus 10 equal to 68. Now let's combine these terms. Combine these terms. 3 plus 1 plus 2 gives us 4 plus 1 plus 2, or 6z. 11 plus 2 plus 3 gives us 16, plus 10 gives us 26. So now 6z should be equal to 68 minus 26, subtracting 26 from both sides, or 6z. equal to 42. Now z is equal to 42 divided by 6, which gives us 7. So now the length of the side from point B to point Z is z plus 2, which is 7 plus 2, or 9 units. Let's try another example. Here we're given this rectangle. The perimeter is given as 64 units. We want to know the value of z. The height of this rectangle is 3z and the width is 4z minus 3. So the perimeter is the sum of all of the side lengths or 2 times 3z plus 2 times 4z minus 3 and that has to be equal to 64 so 6z plus 8z minus 6 is equal to 64 or 14z is equal to 70 so x z has to be equal to 70 over 14. Now let's reduce this fraction. 70 is 7 times 10. 14 is 2 times 7. So z is equal to 10 over 2 or 5. Let's try another word problem with these shapes. The length of a rectangle is three times its width. The area is 300 inches squared. So now, 
what is the perimeter? We're given a rectangle. It must have some width and some length. And we're given that the length is three times its width. So L has to be equal to 3W. What do we know? The area, which is length times width, is equal to 300. So 300 must be equal to, the length is 3W, the width is W, so 300 must be equal to 3w squared. Now let's divide by 3. w squared must be equal to 100. So what number can we square and get 100? We take the square root of both sides. Then w must be the square root of 100, which is 10. Keep in mind here, Really, we should get a plus or a minus, because minus 10 squared is also 100. But, since we're talking about the length of a side of a rectangle, we would only take the positive case given this particular physical situation. Now we know the width and we know the length. If the width is equal to 10, then the length is equal to 30. So the perimeter is equal to 2 times W plus 2 times L, since we have a rectangle. So that is 2 times 10 plus 2 times 30, or 20 plus 60, or 80 inches. Let's try another example, where here we're given the length of a rectangle is five times its width. And we know the area of the rectangle is 500 yards. So let's find its perimeter. Let's first draw a rectangle and fill out what information we're given. The length is five times the width, so if the width is W, then the length, L, has to be five times W. So the area, is length times width, tells us that 500 yards squared has to be five W times W, or 500 is equal to 5w squared. Now if we divide by 5, we get w squared is equal to, again, 100. So just like before, taking the square root of both sides, we only get a positive case, which is 10. Now we can calculate the perimeter, which is equal to 2l plus 2w. the width is equal to 10, then the length is equal to 50, so the perimeter is 2 times 10 plus 2 times 50. That gives us 20 plus 100, or 120 yards. Now let's try an example when we go in the op where we go in the opposite order. Again, we're given a, a rectangle with some width and some length. The length, again, will be five times the width, but this time we're given the perimeter. Let's use that information to determine what is the area. Now we know that the perimeter, which is 2L times 2 plus 2W, is equal to 72. So 2 times 5 times w plus 2 times w has to be equal to 72. 
for 10w plus 2w equals 72. So 12w has to equal 72. Now dividing by 12, we get w is equal to 72 over 12. Let's try not to use a calculator. I know that 72 is 2 times 36. 12 is 2 times 6. So 36 over 6 gives us 6. Now we know the width, which means we can determine the length. If we have both the length and the width, then we can determine the area. The area has to be 30 times 6, which gives us 180 square feet. Let's try another example like that given a rectangle. Now we know the length of the rectangle is six centimeters longer than its width. So the length is given by W plus six. We know that the perimeter, which is 2W plus 2L, is equal to 44. So 2 times W Let's be very careful here. 2 times L gives us 2 times W plus 6 is equal to 44. Now, let's distribute, solve for W. 2W plus 2W plus 12 is equal to 44. So 4W subtracting by 12 must be equal to 32. So W must be equal to 32 over 4, which is equal to 8. So the width is 8, hence the length must be 14. And so the area is equal to 8 times 14, which is 80 plus 24, 80 plus 32. double check 112 14 times 8 equals 112 what are our units here we started with centimeters centimeters times centimeters gives us centimeters squared